In the fall of 1985, a group of men in hard hats pushed open the rusted metal gates of an abandoned cotton mill near downtown Atlanta. They didn't know it, but they were about to make a big discovery. The mill was an enormous red brick structure with two smokestacks and a water tower. After shutting down in the 70s, it now sat in a state of perdition. It was an eyesore and a safety hazard, standing watch over the tiny Atlanta community that had grown up around it, Cabbage Town. By the 80s, the only signs of life inside the gates of the mill were rats and the occasional trespassing graffiti artist. It's likely that on that day in 1985, at least one of those men in hard hats looked up and saw an infamous quote that had been spray-painted high on the walls of one of the buildings. The dark is near, the night is bold, there is no comfort when the soul grows cold. This mill used to be one of the largest employers in Atlanta, but now it had been purchased by these men for a measly $3.1 million. With flashlights in hand, they entered the first darkened building. Their lights illuminated sprawling rooms filled with ancient machinery, silhouetted like ghostly metal dinosaurs in the dark. The men moved carefully through the mill's crumbling and dust-covered buildings, cataloging everything they encountered along the way. Eventually, they entered mill building number two. They thought they'd find more of the same, rotting wood floors and rusting machinery. But they were wrong. This building was different. Buried deep inside the mill complex was the executive suite. For nearly 100 years, this is where the company's tycoons had managed their cotton empire. As the developers' flashlights panned the room, one light paused. Way in the back of the room, a single black door. As the team approached the door, they noticed it was different from the others. This was the unmistakable black steel door of a safe, a fortified vault large enough for a man to walk into. They pried it open. Affixed to the inside of the door was a disintegrating scrap of paper, the only legible words being receipt, city taxes, Atlanta, and 1892. As they stepped inside the forgotten vault, flashlights in hand, the men discovered a collection of trunks, shelves, and filing cabinets, organized but covered in grime. This vault was a massive archive filled with historical documents, untouched since the mill closed up shop. Someone had stored the mill's important paperwork here, safeguarded behind lock and key. There were blueprints, handwritten letters, newspaper clippings, bulky ledgers, and personnel files, all from the factory's 97-year history. There were thousands and thousands of documents. Some had been damaged by time and moisture, but most were perfectly preserved. These guys didn't know it, but they'd just stumbled upon Atlanta's version of King Tut's tomb. Their day of assessment had turned into a day of archaeology. Of course, it wasn't as sexy as gold and coffins and mummified cats, but in its own right, this was a buried treasure by historical standards. Sensing this was significant, the men phoned some researchers at Georgia Tech University just a few miles away. I don't know who received that call, but I've seen her notes from that day. Making a list of what they could retrieve, she wrote, quote, "'Trunk against the vault and basement may be wet.'" documents, end quote. For a librarian, this must have felt like the Super Bowl. Several days later, a caravan of researchers, historians, and archivists rolled into the Fulton Bag and Cotton Mill compound and began their investigation, which quickly turned into an excavation. They loaded the entire archive of documents onto some trucks and sped back to the Georgia Tech Library. For the next few months, the research team processed and cataloged the collection. Bit by bit, they began piecing together the cotton mill's mysterious past and its beginnings in 1881. Much of what they found was mundane, but not all of it. Hidden amongst the mundane details of employee pay records and budget reports was a dirty little secret. There was a reason these millionaire millmen kept their secrets behind lock and key. And for the first time ever, their secret was out.
Now, I didn't know any of this was happening in 1985. Hell, I was only three years old. The only story I cared about was Fraggle Rock, my favorite TV show. Our family lived in Azle, Texas, 830 miles from Atlanta. My dad was a preacher at a tiny Southern Baptist church, and my mom was a teacher at a small Christian school. I was the youngest of three sons, Brett, though now I go by B.T. My parents didn't grow up in Texas. My dad grew up in Alabama, and my mom grew up in Mississippi. In the 70s, dad was training to be a preacher, so he moved our family to Dallas so he could go to seminary. Dad was a big sports guy. While in Dallas, he taught us to be fans of the Cowboys and the Mavericks. In the late 80s, we moved back to Alabama because dad got a preaching gig at a new church. Our allegiance to the Cowboys and the Mavs eventually faded, but one sports loyalty certainly did not. Dad had graduated from the University of Alabama, so my brothers and I were all raised as huge Alabama Crimson Tide football fans. My dad's new job took us to a little town in North Alabama called Florence, which is not far from where he grew up. Florence was your typical conservative, religious, small Alabama town, and to be honest, I loved growing up there. Florence was really safe. Hell, we'd go years without a single murder. The nearest interstate was about 45 minutes away, and people always said that's why it was so safe, because the riffraff just couldn't get to us. Mom drove a minivan. We were in church three times per week. I played Little League Baseball. Dad would take us fishing on the Tennessee River on the weekends, pier fishing, of course. We couldn't afford a boat back then. In high school, I played basketball and football. I had a really great family growing up. The older I get, the more thankful I am for that. After high school, I went to the local college in Florence, the University of North Alabama. In my sophomore year, 9-11 happened. A bunch of us huddled around a boxy television in the student government office, wide-eyed and barely able to breathe. I remember the screams when the first tower collapsed. I also joined a fraternity in college and eventually became president of the chapter. I treated it like a full-time job, and we worked really hard not to be just your typical frat bros. We focused on grades and community service and intramurals. We won some awards. I was very proud. After college, the dreaded real world. I jumped on board with a startup in Birmingham, Alabama. That was 2005. Our company did fundraisers for elementary schools. I was single and broke, but I loved my work and the people I got to do it with. In 2007, I moved to Nashville, Tennessee with the same company and launched our business there. Shortly thereafter, I began to realize I was a crappy salesman. My business unit was running on fumes, and then the economy collapsed. My boss in Atlanta called me and said, there's good news and bad news. The bad news is we're shutting down operations in Nashville. The good news is we want you to move to Atlanta to lead the marketing team. And so in 2009, I moved to Atlanta for work. The ATL. The home of horrible traffic and the world's busiest airport. Home to Coca-Cola, Delta, Home Depot, Chick-fil-A, and of course, the 96 Olympics. Home to countless TV and film productions. Stranger Things, Black Panther, and Avengers Endgame were all filmed here. Home to entertainment legends like Tyler Perry, Outkast, L.A. Reid, Ludacris, Monica, Janelle Monae, Usher, Donald Glover, Gucci Mane, Butcher, Lil Yachty, Migos, and Lil Nas X. And home to historical legends like W.E.B. Du Bois, Margaret Mitchell, Hank Aaron, Jimmy Carter, and of course, the Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. That's the Atlanta I was about to move to. By 2015, I was at the top of my career game. I was with the same company but had been promoted to executive vice president of client experience. I led a team of about 20 people who ensured that our school clients all over the country were happy with their fundraising experience. I'd been living that single apartment life with roommates, but had been saving to buy a place of my own. I'd been living on the fringes of Atlanta, but I wanted to buy somewhere in the city. I've always had this theory that small town kids are universally fascinated by tall buildings. Well, I was a small town kid, and this was my chance to get closer to the tall buildings. I began looking for places online, mostly in the neighborhoods just east of downtown. It was during that search that I discovered a couple of lofts for sale at a place called The Stacks. 
The Stacks was an old cotton mill they'd converted into residential lofts in the 90s. Exposed brick, high ceilings, and enormous windows with sweeping views of the downtown skyline. The photos online were amazing. Each listing bragged about the charming mill village known as Cabbage Town. There were some restaurants and bars that were walkable. I was feeling it. A few months into my home search, I was hanging out with my friend Jeff Schinnebarger. Jeff is a friend, but also sort of a mentor of mine. He started a nonprofit in Atlanta called Plywood People. They support startups, solving big problems, and doing general good around the city. We met at his office that day, which coincidentally was in Cabbage Town. After our meeting, he walked me to my car. It was a cold and gray day in November. How's the house hunt going? He asked me. Not so bad. I'm actually thinking about getting a place there. I gestured up towards the cotton mill's smokestacks towering right above us. Jeff rolled his eyes and leaned back. Man, you don't want to live there. That place is cursed, he said, half laughing and half serious. What do you mean, I asked. Well, for one, the place burned when they were renovating it in the 90s and a guy nearly died. They still don't know it started the fire. And then a few years ago, it got hit by a tornado. I'm telling you, that place is cursed. (laughs) Well, the lofts are cool and I like the neighborhood and I don't believe in curses, I told him. I got in my car and began the drive back home, leaving Cabbage Town in the rearview mirror. I don't believe in curses, I thought to myself. But sure enough, once I got home, I did what anyone would do when confronted with rumors of a curse. I googled it. I found the story of the fire Jeff had mentioned. It had happened in 1999, and sure enough, a guy nearly died. He was a crane operator, and they had to rescue him in a helicopter. It was pretty dramatic because smoke and flames were coming up all around him. CNN carried the whole rescue on live TV. After the fire, they were able to save the building and finish the renovation. Then in 2008, a tornado descended on downtown Atlanta and began chomping and stomping its way east towards Cabbage Town. The twister collapsed several brick walls and devastated the top floor of old mill building number two. In pics from that day, it looks like a giant claw came down from the clouds and scraped off the top floor of the building, like someone peeling an orange. Thankfully, no one was hurt. Two freak accidents do not a curse make, I thought to myself. Nevertheless, I kept Googling. If I was going to live there, I wanted to know more about this town of cabbages. So I clicked and read, clicked and read, clicked some more, scrolled some more, and read some more. I hunkered over my laptop, devouring anything I could find. And then I found it, the mother load. The Archives and Records Management of the Library and Information Center of the Georgia Institute of Technology, Georgia Tech. I'd just stumbled upon the digitized collection of the documents those men in hard hats had found in that vault exactly 30 years earlier, the one with the big secret. Within minutes, I was sucked in, transported to a different Atlanta, one that was wilder, darker, more sinister. Minutes turned into hours. I was mesmerized, and I could hardly believe what I was reading. This story was half history, and half Hollywood. It was like a blockbuster movie, but it was all true. Recorded in painstaking detail for future generations of historians, researchers, and me. Curse or no curse, I didn't care. I was moving to Cabbage Town. So in 2016... That's exactly what I did. I bought a two-bedroom, two-bath loft at the old Fulton Bag and Cotton Mill. The listing boasted, quote, floor-to-ceiling windows, soaring ceilings, lots of interior brick walls, concrete floors, and so much more, end quote. I still live there today. I got the key to the place in March of 16. My unit was in the same building where the fire broke out in 99. Most of the wood was burnt out of the building, but not all of it. Even today, I can look up in my bedroom and see two-by-fours charred black by the flames. As I settled in that summer, I began to fall in love with my place and the neighborhood around it. Discovering that first crazy Cabbage Town story was like a gateway drug into Atlanta history. 
I'd always been into old stuff, old people, old places, old things. There's a picture of me as a kid, maybe three or four, working in the garden with both of my grandfathers. In high school, my dad and I got really into collecting arrowheads and other artifacts made by the people who roamed the forests of North Alabama before Europeans arrived. We'd walk the freshly plowed cotton fields of Colbert County looking for thousand-year-old flint tools. And then, as an adult, I got into antiques, all the antiques. My loft is filled with them. You can have your shiny and new, but me, I'll take old and weathered every day of the week. Naturally, I loved researching the history of what happened around my new place. I scoured old news clippings, read everything online, bought new books at museums and old books from antique stores. And the deeper I went, the more intense it got. As the 1800s turned into the 1900s, more conflict, more drama, more outrageous tales from the growing railroad town of Atlanta. And tragedy. So much tragedy. There were times I had to shut my computer. History is often bloody, naked, and depressing. And as it turns out, bloody, naked, and depressing doesn't make it into high school history books. These were the stories the adults had tried to hide from us. As I continued my research, several particular stories emerged, four of them to be exact. Like four hands reaching up from the grave, these tales grabbed me, held me, and brought me nose to nose with some moments so dark you want to crawl into that grave to escape them. Now, these four stories were all happening around the same time in Atlanta, and the local newspapers covered them in sensational detail. Competing headlines dotted the front pages. Players in the stories overlapped. I was fascinated by the timeline, so I plotted each story's chain of events on a spreadsheet. 56 months. This wasn't four separate stories. This was one Big story, filling Atlanta's newspapers with ink and terrifying the city's citizens over the span of 56 months. Man, somebody ought to tell this story, I thought to myself. I'm old enough to know that when I think somebody ought to do something, say something, or fix something, it's worth pausing to consider whether that someone might be me. So that's what I did. I realized no one had ever told this story in this way. And I began stitching the story together, both in my mind and on my laptop. I did more research. I let it simmer. I took more notes. I let it simmer. I read some more books. I let it simmer. I interviewed people. I let it simmer. I did this for several years, to be exact. In that time, I quit my job and went out on my own as a creative consultant. But the idea for this story, it never went away. It kept simmering. But then, as it always does, doubt. If you're a dreamer listening to this, then you know that doubt always slithers in. BT, you're too busy with other projects. You don't have time for this. Besides, who are you to tell this story? Parts of this story have already been told. You're late to the party, bro. The story, it's too complicated. And the loudest one of all? BT, the story is racial. The story is Atlanta, and you, you're just another white guy. You have no business in this conversation, and you're just going to piss people off. (laughs) Ouch. Maybe that inner voice was right, so I let all the simmering stop for a while. But then I finally got the courage to share my idea with a few people. First, my friends Anne and Carrie. Over margaritas one night, I laid out the whole story. They listened patiently, and after a few seconds of silence, Anne looked me in the eye and said, BT, you've got to do it. Seriously, you've got to do it. I ran the idea by a few of my black friends next. Several of them told me something along the lines of, BT, no matter what you do, you're going to piss some people off. Just go for it. I slept on it a few more weeks, and then I made my decision. It was time to bring this story into the light of day. Now, now is the time to tell it. I may not do it perfectly. I may make some mistakes, but it's time. And that's what you're listening to now. 
This is Catlick, the lost story of a 56-month saga that nearly destroyed the South's grandest city. Since deciding to tell this story, I've put my research into overdrive. I've visited libraries and museums. I've worked with research assistants and archivists. I've consumed so much of this stuff, I've literally had nightmares of sitting in a courtroom on trial being falsely accused of murder. The story has gotten into me and made me feel crazy at times. In this research, I've discovered a whole new world that most Americans today know nothing about. It's a world of mobs and martial law. It's a world of cursed land and lying journalists. It's a world of bar brawls and barbaric outlaws. It's a world of fine ladies in gowns and mysterious madams of the night. It's a world of refugee wagons on American soil and robber barons. It's a world of spy machines and serial killers. It's a world of midnight stalkers and deranged doctors. It's a world of crime-solving astrologers and country music legends. It's a world of feminist icons and inexplicable theses. It's a world of whiskey gangs and motorcycle daredevils. It's a world of seedy saloons and sweltering courtrooms. It's a world of midnight marches and raucous rallies. This is a world of churches burning in the night, blood slick knives, wooden gallows surrounded by cheering crowds, and bundles of dynamite carefully slipped under moonlit porches. This is a world you have to see to believe. And letting myself see it has changed me forever. And now, now I want to invite you. I want you to go there with me. This is going to feel less like a podcast and more like a road trip into a strange new world. And like a road trip, you can't bail until we reach the destination. What's the destination? 56 months. That's the finish line. No, this podcast isn't going to take 56 months, and there aren't 56 episodes. But the journey, this story, is a grand tale that starts at month one and ends at month 56. So if you start, I'd ask you to finish. Hang with me till the end. Otherwise, you won't get the full picture. I'm going somewhere with this, and I want you to get there with me. TBH, the only excuse you have for bailing on me is if you get bored. And I promise you won't get bored. I won't let that happen. Now, a few other reminders for those who decide to join me on this journey. Number one, this story, it's not suitable for everyone. At times, it's violent and it's gory. At times, I will say words you'd rather not hear. If you're easily disturbed, offended, or triggered, I love you, but please find another podcast consider this your warning. Number two, we're going to have to look at some ugly things, not skim past them, not look away, not sweep them under a rug. We're going to have to look at them, stare at them, and talk about them. This story includes some very ugly, racially divisive moments. I know there's a line of thinking out there that says we shouldn't talk about these things, that we should forget about them and move on, but I don't agree with that. I think it's the responsibility of each generation to remember, to sit with these ugly moments. And it's our responsibility to retell the old tales, to reteach the horrible lessons of our past so we don't repeat them. Number three, everything you're going to hear is true. I've taken painstaking detail to ensure this story is historically accurate. This is not based on a true story. This is a true story. I've worked with research assistants, archivists, and museums to confirm as many facts as possible. Now, bona fide historians will be the first to tell you that history is tough to nail down. And finding the truth is precarious because it's always written from the perspective of the people in power. That's why I've done everything I can to cross-check my findings, reference multiple sources, and ensure that I'm telling this story as accurately as I can with the sources available to me. Number four, I'm going to do everything I can to respect you. You joining me in this is a big deal. I take it very seriously. At some point, I'm probably going to say something that offends you. If that happens, please forgive me in advance. That is not my intent. 
I want to be clear that everyone is invited into this story. So if you're a cattle farmer in Graham, Texas, or a preacher in Stillwater, Oklahoma, or a nursing mom in Huntsville, Alabama, you're welcome here. And if you're a drag queen in the Castro, or a sculptor in Manhattan, or a barista in Portland, this story is for you too. You and I may be very different, but I want you here, in this story. You matter, and your perspective matters. Next, we're going to talk about America. This story takes place at a time when America was going through crazy amounts of change. This story may be set in Atlanta, but it's about America. You don't have to be from Atlanta to appreciate it or understand it. We're going to talk about where America has been and where it's going. If you're listening to this in 2020 or 2023 or 2028, it's still going to matter. And we're going to answer one burning question. Is America the villain or the hero? And finally, this podcast is only half of the cat lick experience. This is the audio experience, but there's a visual experience too. I call it the vault in that it's a historical treasure chest I've curated just for cat lick listeners. Think of it as a visual content upgrade to the audio listening experience. The vault is packed with digitized artifacts from the stories you'll hear in Catlick. Vintage photos, newspaper clippings, old maps, and tons more. This lets you see what the people and places from the story actually looked like. Plus, I'll be adding tons of original content as well, including pictures from my life in Cabbage Town, walking video tours, insider tips, additional mini episodes that I call half licks, and even advice on what to do and where to eat when you visit Atlanta. You can access the vault right now for about what you'd pay for a movie ticket. Just go to catlick.com and click on vault. The Atlanta of today looks pretty sharp, pretty put together, but it wasn't always this way. At one time, this was a city on the brink of chaos. Over 100 years ago, the world was changing, and Atlanta was about to explode. What transpired over these 56 months was one of the most remarkable and tragic series of events ever to befall a single American city. To understand America, you've got to understand Atlanta. And to understand Atlanta, you've got to understand this true story with these characters during a time when America was pissed off and tearing itself apart. So where do we begin? Well, we've got to go back, way back. Before Migos, before Tyler Perry, before the 96 Olympics, before Chick-fil-A, before Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., and even before Margaret Mitchell wrote Gone with the Wind. It's month number one of our story, and we begin on a stormy night in the streets of Atlanta. Just ahead, there's a woman, and behind her is the outline of a tall man in a dark hat. Are you ready? My name is B.T. Harmon. Welcome to the world of Catlick. Lick is recorded in Atlanta's historic Cabbage Town neighborhood. It's written and produced by me, B.T. Harmon. Executive producer, Walnut Ridge Harmon. Original music and sound design by Duciel. If you're feeling this story, be sure to let us know by leaving a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to great podcasts. It makes a huge difference. And remember, you can subscribe to the Cat Lick Vault at catlick.com. This is B.T. Harmon reminding you to save old buildings, build bike lanes, and vote for public transit. I'll see you in the next episode.